Mini episode 1173 of the FDH Lounge is brought to you by Sportsology, delivering unconventional columns and webcasts about sports, TV, music, movies, and more. Follow them on the web at sportsology.com. The FDH Lounge. You want to schedule your life around it. A long time ago, on a gloomy, wet Cleveland spring night, two men stand alone amidst the late night drizzle. Their voices echo across the vacant station parking lot as they debate the merits of the great American radio show that have been missing for far too long. On that night, an idea was born. That idea became the FDH Lounge. Welcome to the FDH Lounge. Hello, everyone. Welcome to FDH Lounge mini episode number 1173. This is FDH managing partner Rick Morris here with you for what has become a holiday tradition here in the FDH Lounge. I speak, of course, of our preview of the upcoming bowl season. We have done this for the last several years with our good friend from our sports central, Franz Stuckberry. And, uh, again, nobody watches more football than I know of, uh, personally, anyways, at every single freaking level than this guy, including the XFL, which uh, he covered before and he will be covering again. And we're going to talk about that a little bit uh, before we get done today and preview some of the coverage he's going to be doing including coming back into the lounge subsequently to talk about it. But uh, today we are on the College Bowls and uh, the, the wrap-up to what has been a very wild season in college football. As we end the 2010s, we begin the 2020s. Uh, it, it, it just I can't even believe those words are coming out of my mouth. The 2020s are upon us here, but uh, who better to break it down with? Uh, who could be more authoritative than good friend Fran Stuckberry, from our Sports Central. Fran, welcome back to the show, my friend. How are you this holiday season? Doing great, Rick. Happy to be here. Very happy to have you, as per always. And uh, we have a lot of things uh, brewing here in college football. Before we get into the games themselves, I will mention that we have had a couple of coaching changes at this point in time here. This is always generally the case this time of year with the old carousel. Appalachian State's Eli Drinkwitz moving up to Missouri. Lane Kiffin moving to Mississippi, which I think a lot of people thought that whenever he made the move back up into a power conference, it might be more for more of a power team than a lower division team in the SEC West, but uh, such is the move that he makes. Mike Norvell going to Florida State, that would seem like a pretty good move based on the success that he had at Memphis. Those are some of the biggies at the moment here, and it, the news broke on the day that we are taping here, that Mike Norvell will not be coaching in the Cotton Bowl. No great surprise. So a little bit of a letdown for a Memphis program that has built its way to what's going to be the biggest game in school history. Uh, but uh, probably the only thing that could be done under the circumstances with the height of recruiting season. So uh, any thoughts on any of the moves that have materialized thus far, Fran? Well, I think Mark, Mike Norvell is, is the right is the right hire for Florida State. I think he did a phenomenal job with Memphis, the high power offense recruiting. I think I think I think the Florida is going to get it right on you know, Mike Norvell. Lane Kiffin going back to the SEC, he's going to make a ton of headlines. He's going to make you know a ton of outspoken statements. He's going to be you know, when, they, when they play Alabama, you know, this kid media is going to be having a frenzy with him. So he's going to be fun for that to have him back in the SEC. Absolutely, yeah. The media circus is just going to be incredible with him being in there. And uh, again, uh, Lane Kiffin loves him some Lane Kiffin. He wouldn't have it any other way. So uh, when you go to the uh, the bowl season and the way that it is going to be unwinding, it generally begins on a Saturday. Uh, this year, I am noticing it begins on a Friday, actually. The Bahamas Bowl uh, from the Bahamas, coincidentally, uh, 2 o'clock on December 20th, Charlotte versus Buffalo. Later that day in the Frisco Bowl in Frisco, Texas, Kent State v. Utah State. Uh, you've also got that, that same day, uh, I'm sorry, this is the 21st, uh, the New Mexico Bowl uh, in, you guessed it, New Mexico, Central Michigan versus San Diego State in the Cure Bowl in Orlando, Liberty v. Georgia Southern, the Boca Raton Bowl, uh, this is one of the rare games that is on ABC as opposed to any of the other networks, albeit, by the way, the Cure Bowl is on CBS Sports Network, but the Boca Raton Bowl is Florida Atlantic v. SMU, you have the Camellia Bowl, FIU Panthers versus Arkansas State Red Wolves. 
the, in the Las Vegas Bowl in Sam Boyd Stadium. I think this might be the last one in Sam Boyd Stadium, or at least one of the last ones. They'll be moving to the Raiders' new stadium. Uh, Washington versus Boise State. This will also be on ABC, so I guess they got a doubleheader that day. In the New Orleans Bowl, it is the UAB Blazers v. Appalachian State. They're taking off December 22nd because the NFL plays that day. On the 23rd, the Gasparilla Bowl in Tampa, Marshall v. UCF. And on December 24th in Aloha Stadium, the BYU Cougars v. the Hawaii Rainbow Warriors. So that's the slate leading up to Christmas Day. What are the big things that jump out at you out of that group of games, Fran? A couple of things that, things that jump out at me, Rick, in the Bahamas Bowl, uh, it's going to their first ever bowl game, so that's a big accomplishment to them. Uh, in the current bowl, the Liberty, uh, the first year FBS, and, um, they get to go to a bowl game, so that's a great accomplishment to them as well. I mean, some, I mean, some, of, the, I mean, some of the other other games um, uh, have an appeal. SVU, um, SVU's going to score like 70 points in their bowl, in that bowl with home bowl with their high-power offense. Yeah, those a uh, couple of those matchups are definitely going to be very interesting, including that one there, no question about it. On uh, December 26th in the Independence Bowl, this is uh, one of the ones that dates back a couple of decades. A lot of these minor bowls don't have deep roots, but they've been playing the Independence Bowl in Shreveport for decades now. Louisiana Tech v. Miami of Florida in that one, and the Quick Lane Bowl in Detroit that day, Eastern Michigan v. Pittsburgh. You've got the traditional MAC influence there in that bowl, a quasi-home game for Eastern Michigan. The Military Bowl from Annapolis, Temple versus North Carolina, and the Pinstripe Bowl uh, in New York. Uh, this is December 27th at Yankee Stadium, Michigan State v. Wake Forest. Uh, not sure how much interest that's going to have in the northeast part of the country, but we shall see. Uh, in the Texas Bowl, in uh, NRG Stadium in Houston, Oklahoma State v. Texas A&M. That should be kind of an interesting one. The Holiday Bowl, traditionally a good game in San Diego. Iowa v. USC. This one really should be no different. These are two programs much in need of a win. In the Cheez-It Bowl at Chase Field in Phoenix, playing one in the baseball park there, it is the Air Force Falcons v. Wazoo, the Washington State Cougars. On December 28th, the Camping World Bowl. Coincidentally, in Camping World Stadium in Orlando, Iowa versus Notre Dame. This one's going to be on ABC. On December 30th, the First Responder Bowl in University Park, Texas, Western Michigan versus Western Kentucky. Uh, who will stand alone atop the, the, the Western powers here? We shall find out in that game. The Music City Bowl uh, in Nashville, Mississippi State versus Louisville. The Red Box Bowl at Levi Stadium in Santa Clara, California. Illinois versus the Cal Golden Bears in a quasi-home game here, staying in the Bay Area. And on December 31st, we've got the Belk Bowl in Charlotte, Kentucky v. Virginia Tech. The Sun Bowl, uh, this one is always traditionally on CBS. Another bowl that goes back many decades, uh, this one in El Paso, Arizona State versus Florida State. In the Liberty Bowl, another one, another one of these uh, minor bowls that goes back a long period of time from Memphis. Number 23, Navy versus Kansas State. In the Arizona Bowl, taking place in Houston, uh, Tucson. This one is on the CBS Sports Network. Uh, and I'm, I'm only mentioning networks when it's not ESPN or ESPN2 for the most part, because that's where most of these are. Wyoming v. Georgia State. And the Alamo Bowl at the Alamo Dome in San Antonio, Texas versus number 11 Utah. Utah tumbling all the way out of the uh, the New Year's Six Bowls into this one. Uh, traditionally, teams have not done so well. I've uh, kind of treated it as a letdown game. We'll see if they do against Texas, who's having, quite frankly, a letdown season. So, thoughts on this next chunk of bowls here, uh, Fran? I mean, some of the uh, the, uh, the Holiday Bowl is a really good matchup with. Uh... With uh, with uh, USC and, and Iowa, that should be a fun match. But I, I I think USC made the right choice to play Hell another year. I mean, they, they were decimated by injury, but they had three quarterbacks that I mean, they played great. I, I mean, give them one more year because you know, Rick, maybe Urban Meyer might you know want to come back another year I mean, and, 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 um, or go to the NFL. We shall see. Another game that appeals to me is the Iowa State um, Notre Dame game. That's a Matt Campbell got an extension at Iowa State Notre Dame. I always say it'll be pumped up to play them. 
Let me ask you this on the thought of USC, Fran. Uh, is, is there any thought whatsoever? You, you look at, uh, it was a very similar situation at LSU where they promoted Ed Orgeron. He kept the job after an interim basis. And, uh, again, especially in the last two years, especially this year, has really, really turned it around. In any way, shape, or form, does that benefit Clay Helton as far as being able to point to a situation and say, hey, at one point they were about to run Ed Orgeron out of town and look at him now, that could be me? Well, I think, I think, it, I think it did. I mean, I mean they, had, they had so many injuries this year. They were decimated by injuries. They had so many games. And plus the fact that, plus the fact that I don't really know if there are any, any other marquee coaches out there that they could get that they probably wanted. So they figured, like, we'll give him another year, at least another year, you know, and, if, and, if, and if you can turn things around, fine. If not, then they will look elsewhere after next season. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And, uh, again, I, I think he is really going to be on the spot next year, uh, although a lot of people were saying this this year and even last year. Remember, he survived uh, by a razor's edge last year coming into this year. So next year truly will be the make or break for him there at Southern Cal, and we'll see how the gamble of retaining him goes. We're going to go through the rest of the games here leading up to the New Year's Six Bowls. We'll take that in the next chunk. But uh, the remaining games uh, of the, uh, the, the non-New Year's Six variety uh, slash playoff variety, the Citrus Bowl, January 1st, Camping World Stadium in Orlando, number 14, Michigan versus number 13, Alabama. This will be a doozy on ABC uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this when we get to uh, the Orange Bowl. I, I think Alabama had a very good case for still being in the New Year's Six. Uh, it'll be very, very interesting to see if it's a letdown game for them. Alabama has not missed the playoffs until this year, and traditionally the, the bowl games that they have played under Nick Saban, when they haven't had that much to play for, it has showed that they haven't had that much to play for. So we'll see if there's any sulking, pouting, or letdowns there versus a Michigan team that's got to be coming in off its own letdown uh, after the uh, the annual arse whooping at the hands of Ohio State. In the Outback Bowl in Tampa, it's number 18 Minnesota against number 12 Auburn. That should be an excellent game. That, to me, is, is going to be one of the best of all of the non-major bowls. On January 2nd, the Birmingham Bowl at Legion Field in Birmingham, it's Boston College versus number 21 Cincinnati. The Gator Bowl, another traditional bowl going back many decades, this one being held in Jacksonville as per always. Another interesting game, Tennessee, who I'm a fan of, uh, and it's been a lot of hard times for me with that being the case. They are facing Indiana, and uh, that, that should be a very hard-fought game. Both of those teams want momentum coming into next year, Indiana having uh, one of the better years they've had in a long time. Speaking of teams that I like, my alma mater is playing on January 3rd in the famous Idaho Potato Bowl in Boise. Uh, my Ohio Bobcats, a very disappointing 6-6 six and six season, i got to say. just th This year has not been what we wanted, uh, much less having our hated arch enemies winning the conference. Uh, we are playing the Nevada Wolf Pack, so we'll see how that goes. January 4th, Armed Forces Bowl in Fort Worth, Texas. Tulane versus Southern Miss. And January 6th, the Lending Tree Bowl in Mobile, Alabama. The aforementioned Miami Red Hawks, our hated arch rivals at Ohio University, the Harvard on the Hawking. They will be playing the Louisiana Ragin' Cajuns, who I can only hope uh, will open up a big can of whoop-ass on them on national television, but we shall see. So uh, this next uh, group of games here, uh, again, some, some very, very interesting ones here, Fran, from, from the January 1st games of teams that had very good years, uh, or, or in the case of, of, of Michigan, you know, not, not a great year, but right about where they've been the last couple of years. And I guess it was disappointing for Alabama also, but Minnesota and Auburn had very good years. You move on, you look at some of the rest of the games here, Tennessee and Indiana, Seem pretty evenly matched. They're going to be kind of elbowing each other, trying to get a leg up for next year. A Boston College program in transition playing Cincinnati. Uh, a lot of intrigue after January 1st in the Bulls, I think, Fran. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of intrigue. There's definitely a lot of intrigue. I'm really looking forward to watching the Indiana Tennessee game. Tennessee, uh, after you know, uh, having a terrible start, they, they, turned it, they, they, they turned the season around on a hot streak going to their Indiana. They gave the coach an extension because he's been winning. I mean, how many times do you win eight or nine games at Indiana? It doesn't happen. So they reward it with an extension and keep him there for quite some time. Uh, the, the, um, the 
uh, Auburn, 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 Minnesota game should be an interesting game to watch. We'll see, we'll, we'll see who, who wins that game. But, uh, um, you know, with Michigan, Alabama, I mean, Michigan, Michigan's not where they, where they are. They're, 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 they're not, they're not they're, they won nine, ten games. But the thing is, with them, I mean, will they ever get on that side and be Ohio State? I don't know. Not the way that they're presently situated. And, uh, again, there's there's been a lot of interesting debate in the media in the last several months about, you know, what is Michigan's actual potential peak as a football power. If you look at it over a period of time, it's only been sporadically that they have been among the best of the best of the best nationally. Certainly in the very early days of the program, uh, under Bo, they did well. But, uh, again, it weren't really in, in, in the national title picture too many times under Bo. I mean, they did a, they did a great job. Uh, but, uh, again, a lot of times in the Rose Bowl came up empty. Uh, they did get that half a national championship in 97. Uh, so, again, historically a, a good but not great program, basically, ever since, again, the early days when they were dominant. And the, the main reason that they're still ahead of Ohio State in the series is that Michigan was such a dominant program in the early part of the 20th century. It's funny that we're about, I think, about a decade away from Ohio State passing them at the current rate, and uh, all hell is going to break loose when uh, everybody at uh, Michigan doesn't have that to brag about anymore, Fran. Yeah, I mean, I mean Michigan just... But the problem with, with with Michigan is that uh, I mean uh, he, he really, I mean uh, Jim Harbaugh I mean he's, he's a good coach but the thing is uh, you know who, who could do better than him I don't think anyone can can, do, can get them to the level that Jim Harbaugh has so far. Well, that's true, and that's the whole thing too. When you go to replace him, who are you going to replace him with? I mean you're looking in the direction of guys like probably Matt Campbell, P.J. Fleck, and and at that point in time it's a gamble because these are not coaches that have been in the national championship picture before, not that they really had a chance to at uh, schools like Iowa State and Minnesota, albeit P.J. Fleck, I guess you could say they were in it up until November this year, but not seriously in it. Uh, it didn't, ma- didn't even make it to the, uh, the Big Ten championship game. So, yeah, it, 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 it raises the question of uh, how Michigan can do better, uh, if they can do better. Looking at the big six uh, games here, the New Year's six games, uh, we'll leave the playoff games aside here and come back to that because we'll tackle that as a whole. We alluded to this briefly on December 28th, uh, the Cotton Bowl Classic, uh, noon Eastern time, uh, all these games, by the way, on ESPN, number 17 Memphis, number 10 Penn State. Uh, Memphis will be without their coach uh, as he has moved on to Florida State. It'll be the biggest game in program history. And uh, for Penn State, uh, you know, they, they, they still make it to a major bowl. They lose again to Ohio State. They don't make it to the Big Ten championship game. Not exactly a letdown game for Penn State. Not exactly a game that they're going to be hugely up for. So it will be interesting to see what version of the Nittany Lions we get in this game. Uh, of course, later in the day, the two playoff games, we skip ahead to December 30th in the Orange Bowl. In Miami Gardens, Florida, number nine, Florida versus number twenty-four, Virginia. Me, I think I'd have I'd have stuck Alabama in that spot. Uh, again, I don't. As a Tennessee fan, I don't like Florida or Alabama personally, so it's not a matter of bias in this issue. But I, I just think that Alabama as a program probably has earned it over Florida as far as the uh, the consideration here. But that's just my personal opinion. January first, the Rose Bowl in Pasadena, the traditional battle between Pac-12 and Big Ten. It's number six, Oregon, versus number eight, Wisconsin. Uh, I think it probably would have been a little bit more intrigue had Minnesota made it to the Rose Bowl for the first time in a a long time, but uh, Oregon, Wisconsin, that should be a very good competitive game. And the Sugar Bowl that night, traditionally following it from New Orleans, the number five, Georgia Bulldogs, versus the number seven, Baylor Bears, uh, and, and again, two schools that came close. These are the losers of the SEC and Big 12 championship games, respectively. Uh, Georgia, uh, again, they, they've, they've sort of plateaued at the level that they're at. They got to where they are very quickly under Kirby Smart, and in the first two seasons, they have plateaued there uh, the last uh, two seasons following that. So they have a lot to play for. Baylor, as far as continuing to try to earn respect nationally, I actually think this will be a game where both teams are really into it and really trying to make a statement for 2020. So, how do you see the four games shaking out, Fran? Well, with the Cotton Bowl, 
I still, I still, I still think Penn State's going to win the game. I think uh, I mean, Matt, Matt, it'll be a fun game to watch to be close, but I, I give Penn State the edge in that, in that game. Yeah, I think so and, as well. And, and, and the Orange Bowl, it's just a shame that the, that the HC has such, such a weak season. Virginia, you know, gets in, the, you know, Virginia gets in, gets in that game. I mean, it's a real shame that no, they can't even no, they can't put Notre Dame there or somebody else. It's just it's such, it's, it's a real shame that um, they can't rule. Virginia gets more to mediocrity because nobody was good. Well, that's one of these things, Fran, and if we're talking about college football playoff reform, I don't think any of the conferences would go for this. I mean, maybe the SEC would because they know they'll never be in that spot, but I would kind of agree with you because I think it's a travesty that Virginia gets in there. It was pretty much necessary because of the way that the Bulls are set up that an ACC team go to the Orange Bowl because that's the way these things are structured, but... If you've got an, an ACC team in the playoff, I shouldn't think that there would be a need to have a second S ACC team in one of the New Year's Six Bowls. I mean, to me, as long as every one of the five major conferences is represented somewhere, to me, that ought to be good enough. Because, like you said, the rest of the conference, by and large, compared to the other conferences, compared to the power conferences, Compared to what the ACC is supposed to be, hot garbage this year. It really, really was. I mean, you, you didn't have a single team other than Clemson that deserves to play on this stage. So I wish they would readdress that, but I don't think they're ever going to. No, they won't. The game I don't really have, have much of an interest in watching on. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm more interested in the Memphis Penn State game. That, that game has an appeal. I mean, it's just it's a, it's a shame. It, I mean, Baylor, Baylor, Georgia should be plenty to watch. That'll be a fun up and down game. I think it will be. I think it will be, and I think the Rose Bowl is going to deliver some excitement as well. And then, of course, you have on December 28th the national semifinal games. Uh, we start with the Peach Bowl uh, from Mercedes Benz Stadium in Atlanta. Number one LSU versus number four Oklahoma. Later that night, the Fiesta Bowl. Number two Ohio State. Number three, Clemson in Glendale, Arizona. Ohio State has played many memorable postseason games uh, out in the desert in the 21st century. This will be another one of them. Have struggled historically with Clemson uh, in this decade in big games. So uh, it will be, and of course, three days till the turn of a new decade. So you won't be able to say, oh, it's 2020 now, putting it behind them. No, this will be the last game they play in the 2010s. And uh, of course, again, not looking good against Clemson the last two times out in the postseason. Davo Sweeney has had their number. I thought, in terms of looking at this, uh, when, you, when it comes down to it, I really thought it was a coin flip for a good part of the season, uh, particularly later in the season between LSU and Ohio State. Once LSU had beaten Alabama and established themselves as the preeminent team in the SEC, I think the committee got it right. I, I think it was very close going into the last week. I, I think when LSU puts that much of a curb stomping on Georgia and Ohio State goes out there and struggles for the first half against uh, a Wisconsin team that's inferior to Georgia, there's a lot of bitter people around where I live, you know, grumbling about, oh, it shouldn't come down to style points or whatever, and, and, and that's true. And on a lot of the advanced metrics, Ohio State is favored. But this was a tough, tough year in the SEC, and uh, for, for LSU to go through it unscathed, win the SEC championship game going away, OSU is my dad's alma mater. I root for the school, but in my unbiased sense, they got it right, Fran. I definitely, I definitely, I definitely feel LSU did. You know, dominant all season. The defense, LSU's defense really, the uh, past couple of weeks, you know, played like an elite team. Before, they were winning, but they were shootout games. So, I mean, against Alabama, they really. I, I think I think them beating winning Alabama and then beat, and then beating Georgia, they deserve to be in the top seed. I believe that as well. Uh, many big quality wins in the SEC, even if Ohio State's out of conference schedule was better. And uh, again, it was kind of uncanny that Ohio State's out of conference schedule. They they had a number of teams that were represented in their own conferences championship games, so it was a better strength of schedule than it would have looked like at the beginning of the season. Although I think we knew that, that Florida, Atlantic, and Cincinnati were going to be pretty good in their own conferences. Uh, but uh, to, to have the degree of success that they had, uh, yeah, Ohio State had a, a, a very good schedule this year. I think that uh, LSU had an outstanding schedule when you factor in 
especially, again, the conference games and some of the bigger teams in the conference. And looking at the first uh, game here, LSU-Oklahoma, uh, there was a big sense by everyone, and I think a lot of times cliches get to be cliches because they're true, that there was a big drop-off between the top three teams and whoever would come fourth. Oklahoma wins uh, in uh, what I always refer to as the uh, congratulations for scoring last game, the Big 12 championship game. Uh, Oklahoma happened to score last against Baylor. So even with their suspect defense, they make it into the uh, college football playoff. I'm with the conventional wisdom in this one. I think LSU is going to win this one. I think not a curb stopping from start to finish, but I think they're going to pull away. I'll say something like 45-28. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I, I think uh, I think LSU would definitely win this game. Honestly, if Oregon had stumbled against Arizona State, I think Oregon would have given LSU much for the game, and Oklahoma will, would have. Totally agree with that. Oregon would have been a better game, and uh, the, the the teams that just really stumbled, it would have been fascinating if, if Utah hadn't folded up like they did last year in the Pac-12 championship game. Uh, I was listening to a little bit of their game the week before uh, on the uh, on the radio on uh, Sirius XM. I was, uh, I was hearing that as, as my dad and I were uh, driving for the holidays here. We were listening to a little bit of Utah and Utah's uh, effort the previous week, and they were so psyched up against Colorado. And, oh, this is the year, this is the year. Yeah, not so much. Uh, so uh, both Utah and Oregon had losses that uh, kept them out of that game. But, uh, again, number two, Ohio State, number three, Clemson. Uh, this has a chance to be, at least leading into the championship game, but this has a chance to be the game of the year. Uh, leading up into it, uh, again, two undefeated programs, Clemson with their uh, very long winning streak going back to last year, the defending national champions, both teams getting to play the no respect card for not being number one, especially Clemson being number three. I mean, I think it's justifiable given the schedule that they played, but given their resume, given the talent on the team, Dabo Sweeney, uh, again, he's got some basis to play that no respect card, even if they deserve to be three, as I think that they do. But uh, this one is going to be fascinating. I, I don't enjoy saying this, but in the end, I do give the edge to Clemson here. Uh, I, I think it's a battle that Ohio State has to prove that they can win going in against Clemson. I think there is something uh, of a... Uh, you know, a, a tipping point here that they have to reach as far as making people believe it. This has been a historically great Ohio State team during the regular season, but Clemson has been their biggest bugaboo on the national level in recent years. Uh, my guess is that will continue to be the case in this game. Yeah, I, I agree, Rick. And the odds makers even made Clemson's points here, which doesn't surprise me. People been down at Clemson all year, but they've, they've been dominant. They've been playing great. You can't. I mean, it's not their fault the ACF AC down here. They, I mean, they've been dominant the last like, half of the season, besides the close call against North Carolina. Since then, they I went to the to the NC State game where they were up 40, 40 nothing at halftime, and I left. So, I mean, Clemson, Clemson's been dominant, hands down, and they're going to win this game. Yeah, they are, uh, they're, they're, they're something to behold. And uh, either way, it'll be an incredible national championship game, again, because it is very likely, I think, that LSU is going to be represented one way or another. And coincidentally, this is the year that uh, the game is in New Orleans. It's uh, on a uh, rotating basis, of course, uh, it, the championship game is bid out uh, similar to the way that the Super Bowl is bid out. My guess is that we have seen it in the Bay Area for the last time, given that last year uh, it didn't raise a whole lot of interest uh, in uh, the Bay Area with the championship game being there. Uh, it is a big deal down in SEC country. Uh, it, it will be a quasi-home game for LSU if they are in it. Uh, even notwithstanding that, I just I have a weird kind of a sense. They've had a better year than Clemson. They look better than Clemson, but... On the whole basis of to be the man, you got to beat the man. Clemson's been peaking at kind of the right time. I think I might lean ever so slightly towards Clemson in a national championship game. Well, Rick, once again, uh, we, uh, we, uh, I agree with you. I mean, people, people say because the game's in New Orleans, it gives LSU the edge. But I think Clemson, it's, it, it, they've been dominant the past couple of years. I mean, it, it, shouldn't, it, it shouldn't surprise them. It, it can, that'll be a fun game. It can come down to the end. It'll be a high score. Probably be a high score game because both teams are going to run up. Want to gone up and down the field, but uh, I mean, until Clemson loses, I'm, I'm going to give it to Clemson. You know, when they lose, they'll, they'll shut up. 
I would agree with you. I, I see it the same way you do on that. Uh, there's a couple things I want to touch on with the four teams being in the playoff. You had mentioned this off air uh, about the three of the four teams with the transfer quarterbacks. Let's talk about that first. That that is a fascinating angle to this game. Yeah, you, you have uh, Joe Burrow from uh, Ohio State. You have, you, know, and you have Justin Fields who went from from Georgia to um, uh, to Ohio State, and and, and you have uh, Jalen Hurts who went from Alabama to Oklahoma. Yeah, I mean, th that kind of confluence there is really something to behold. Something that the media is not talking about as much, uh, Fran, is this is something that I had uh, noticed. You, you've got a, another weird commonality between all of the teams in the playoff, that being every one of these teams, the present coach had been the interim coach there prior to getting the job. You, you've got a deal where Lincoln Riley, well, he, maybe he wasn't interim. I guess that's uh, that he'd been on the staff. He was promoted. Bob Stoops basically retired late in the off season to sort of force the administration to give Lincoln Riley a chance, and it just played out very well there. Ryan Day was interim coach for three games during Urban Meyer's last season during his suspension, getting a little bit of a trial basis there, and has come in and uh, has, has done exactly what Lincoln Riley has done, kept the program humming along at a higher level. Ed Orgeron, interim coach, who has actually taken the program to a new level by retooling his offensive staff in the last two years, and as I said before, especially this year. And then you've also got the, the deal with uh, the, the other program here, Clemson, Dabo Sweeney uh, being an interim coach uh, years ago, taking over the program. Uh, and again, raising the program even far above what Ed Orgeron has done because LSU was at a high level before that. Clemson uh, was known pretty much just for underachieving, Clemsoning as they used to say back in the day, and Dabo Sweeney doing program building on a level that Nick Saban did as far as the restoration of Alabama. So these are all coaches who had served time within their programs before ascending to the head job. It's very interesting in this day and age of coaching free agency and going out and getting the hot coaching candidate, all four schools promoted from within. Yeah, it, it's definitely it, it's definitely worked out for, for all, all four programs, and and and, and, and finally LSU was finally ra raising their level in the past. They were just choking the team and losing, and now this is the year they, they get a chance to finally um, finally get the monkey off the back. It is their chance to do it, and uh, if, if they did, it wouldn't surprise me. Again, I'm leaning towards uh, Clemson in the national championship game, but uh, LSU putting it all away would be consistent with the kind of year that they've had. So, uh, again, I, I know that uh, college football is something that you cover very closely as, as you are into uh, all levels of football here at our Sports Central and other places where you are doing football coverage, but uh, in the time... Ahead here, uh, I know we've got the XFL coming up. I'm going to have you back on the show here subsequently here as the season is approaching to talk about that. You've been on the show to talk about it previously. But uh, thoughts that you have on looking ahead. I know that you're going to be doing some expanded coverage of the XFL, and you're going to be delving into it on a very granular level as you did the last time around with the XFL in, in 2001. So you've got to be very excited about that. I definitely am. I'm going to be doing road trips to Washington, D.C. and uh, Dallas uh, to see the New York Guardians play the Defenders and the uh, Dallas Renegades, which will be a, a lot of fun. So I'm looking forward to doing some podcasts, doing a little traveling, and a lot of writing as well. Excellent, excellent. Look forward to checking out your work on that and having you back on the show to talk about it. And like I said, we'll be doing that in the lead-up to the XFL. But uh, for today... Been here talking college football with you. Always a pleasure, my friend. Uh, you, you delve into this stuff. Uh, you, you are a, an expert resource like few other people I know. It's always great to have you on. Thank you very much, Fran. Have a great uh, holiday season, my friend. Thanks, Rick. And there's never too many bowl games because it's a great reward for the programs, the kids, and the TV networks like to see that the ratings are much higher than their usual programs at the time. Absolutely. I don't like the bah humbuggery about bowls either. If you don't like it, don't watch it. But uh, it's fun to have on, and I look forward to the start of the bowl season on December 20th. Thank you very much, Fran. Thank you, everybody, for checking out FDH Lounge mini-episode number 1173. 
we bring the show to a close, we would like to extend our deepest gratitude to NBC, CBS, ABC, Fox, all clear channel affiliates, TNT, TBS, USA, UPN, Deadspin.com, YouTube.com, YTMND.com, MySpace.com, various blogs, Fox News, CNN, CNBC, MSNBC, IamBoard.com, Billboard.com, Google.com, ESPN, ESPN2, ESPN News, ESPN Classic, NBA TV, NFL Network, Sports Time Ohio, Athlon Magazine, Comedy Central, Cartoon Network, The Boomerang Channel, QBC, BET, The Spice Channel, Steno Notebooks, Manwich, Paper Mate Office Supplies, Waitresses, Strippers, Bartenders, Garbage Men, Janitors, Microwave Popcorn, The Writers of The Office, Scrubs, Entourage, My Name is Earl, Oz, Metalocalypse, and The Boondocks, Aquafina, and The Periodic Table of Elements. 